is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in our study of the letter of James, and this, I believe, is our eighth week. Yes. Uh, and we'll be, we're, we're in the, uh, we started last week, we were in the third chapter. So today we're going to pick up uh, in, let me see, in, in verse 13 and 14. James 3, 13 and 14 is where we're going to start. The better place, place to start right now would be to ask, Father, that you would just bless this time. Lord, that you would bless the word that goes forth from here from Bible talk, that it would be a blessing to those who hear. It would be an encouragement to be more like your son, Christ Jesus. That it would be an encouragement, Lord, to surrender ourselves to you, to be the people that you desire us to be. Lord, that we desire instruction from you, that we would walk in the way we should go. So we praise you and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. All right, so as I said, uh, we left off last week in uh, chapter 3. I think we got up to verse 12. So today we're going to start at verse 13. I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. But first I want to, I want to read something else. Okay. I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 2. And I'm going to read all, all from verse 1 through 6. Okay? All right. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Amen. You know, Alice says that the answer is always three, and we've talked many times about the, the, you know, the cord of three strands. It's not easily broken. So knowledge, understanding, and wisdom is one of the most important three-stranded cords that we're going to deal with, right? And by the way, let me just start with this so you know that it's written in Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay. So you can have knowledge without understanding, and you can have both to a greater or lesser degree and not have wisdom. Right? Yeah, that's true. I imagine most of you, the majority of you are listening, drive cars. It takes a certain amount of knowledge to drive a car. I mean, legally, it takes a certain amount of knowledge because you have to be aware of the laws and et cetera and know how to drive the car, right? That doesn't mean that you have any understanding of how the car works. I mean, how much do you know about the, the workings of an internal combustion engine? Just a little I remember from driver's ed. That's scary. <laughs> and you'll notice that an awful lot of people drive, obviously, without wisdom. That's right. Okay? So, keep that in mind. Verse 13 and 14. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. True wisdom puts right action to our knowledge and our understanding. I mean, that's what it is. You need all three. But it's wisdom that's the right wisdom that makes sure that it's all working properly, right? King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, well, Jesus said nobody had given, been given wisdom more than he had. He prayed, and God asked him, what, what, what do you want from me, Solomon? Ask what you want. And he said, so give your servant an understanding heart to judge, that means to govern your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? 1 Kings 3, 9. So Solomon, when he was, God told him, ask whatever you want. And he prayed for wisdom yes. Yes. that he would be able to govern the people of God properly. Right? It wasn't for himself. Not for himself. 
Okay. Now the problem is that there are two kinds of wisdom. Yes. Okay. The next verse makes that clear in verse 15 when it says, This wisdom is not that which comes down from heaven, from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. Now that's not three kinds of wisdom. That's one kind of wisdom, and that's three adjectives put to it, right? It's worldly wisdom. Absolutely. Wisdom that is comes down from above. It's not doesn't come down from above. Because there is wisdom that comes from above. And that's what we need to have. That's what we should greatly desire. But there's also wisdom that is earthly, natural, and demonic. It's also going to be forgettable. Well, the foolishness of the world's wisest man, Solomon, is evident. If we go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and I want to do that, right? Uh, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. In verse, chapter 2, verse 15, this is Solomon talking to himself now. And he said, Then I said to myself, As is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, This too is vanity. So here is Solomon asking the question, Why have I been, why did God give me this wisdom? He'd forgotten. He'd forgotten. God gives each of us believers a gift to serve. Do you remember why he gave you your gift? Solomon forgot. All right. How did that play out? Now think about if he's, if he's, it's not, not like he doesn't have any wisdom now. No. He's saying he has, he has wisdom, but he's forgotten why God gave him. So now he's not operating with that wisdom from above. All right. It's earthly, natural, and demonic. We lean on our own. Yes. And that's very clear. Because when we go back to the beginning of that chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1, Solomon said, So I said to myself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Talking to himself. So enjoy yourself. And behold it too with futility. I said of laughter, it's madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? He wasn't a very happy guy. Here is not only the wisest man, quote unquote, but probably one of the wealthiest men that ever lived on the face of the earth. And he, he's just got no satisfaction. I explored with my mind well, how to stimulate my body with wine, while my mind was guiding me wisely, and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their life. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. <clears throat> and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself, from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had homeborn slaves. I also possessed flocks and herds, larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I provided myself with male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. He's saying, why was I mean what? None of this is satisfying him. Sounds like Mick Jagger. I can't get no satisfaction. You know, Jesus Christ said, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Without a right relationship with God, you will never be satisfied. And think about if he, with all of his wisdom, had forgotten why God had given him wisdom. You know why? Because he started to use that wisdom it's all for his self. Whatever God gives you, he doesn't give you for yourself. He gives you to serve. We are to follow the example of Jesus Christ who said he did not come to be served, but to serve. And that example was made clear on the night in the, the Last Supper when he got down on his knees and washed the feet of his apostles. And he said, I do this as an example for you. What God entrusts you with, he has trusted you to use for his purpose and his purpose is to bless all the people of God. God has given every Christian a gift. Yes. Not just one. I mean, we you know we seem to have been trained by the church to think that there are very special people who have this gift or that gift. But the Word of God says that we all have a gift, and they can we we can have any one of those gifts in operation when it's needed. 
Absolutely, that's what it's here for. It's yeah. to be used when it's needed. Right. But you have to discern when it's needed. Exactly. And you have to use it for the benefit of others. I mean, this is what it says in First Corinthians. You know, that, that, that God, the Spirit of God, works through each one individually as he wills. He works through each one individually because he has gifted each one individually for his purpose, for his purpose and his pleasure, to serve the body of Christ. Okay? Say, yes, that's, that's okay. It's okay. So, that's not the wisdom. The wisdom that Solomon wound up having with his 700 wives and 300 porcupines, the wisdom is not, that's not from wisdom from above, because God has said clearly, thus says the Lord, do not learn the ways of the nations and do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2. And, you know, Paul wrote and said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove with the will of God that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. God has given you a gift. He has entrusted you with a gift to use for his purpose. His purpose is to work in and through the entire body of Christ. It's not for yourself. It's not for your own blessing. And that's something we seem to have lost sight of and lost touch with quite a bit, right? For since the wisdom of... I was just going to ask you, I mean, it's supposed to be used for the body of Christ, right? For the body of Christ first and foremost, right? Right. right. To, to the body and then to whoever God points you to. Because that's what Solomon had prayed, the wisdom for God's people. That's what he, that was, when God said to him, you know, what do you want? Yes. He prayed that he, he would have wisdom to serve the people of God. Right. And then when he got it, he used it to serve so himself. himself. Isn't that what's happening in the church today? Well, is it? I think so. I think so. And then the, the result winds up being the same. It benefits nobody. It doesn't benefit that person that you misusing it, right. and it doesn't benefit those around them. Right. So it says, for since the in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know to come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. First Corinthians that's chapter one verse twenty one. The foolishness of God is greater than the, than, than the, the wisdom of man. I mean, you know. Uh, we have to. Why do you think Jeremiah was moved by the Holy Ghost to say, Every man is stupid, all men are stupid and devoid of knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his molten images are deceitful and there's no breath in them. Jeremiah 10 14, we're not to learn the ways of the world. I mean, this is so simple. If we're not to learn the ways of the world, and that's what God spoke through Jeremiah, and we are to learn the ways of the word then why do we send the, our children to the world to be trained? Hmm. That's stupid. That's stupid. <laughs> it certainly is not the wisdom of God. No. Because I promise you, you cannot send your child to a government school to learn the wisdom of God. They will be taught the wisdom of the world. So why would it surprise you at the end of the day that they act like the world when you send them to the world to be trained? And by the way, parents, you'll answer for that. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things also we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. First Corinthians 2, that's chapter, that's chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. You, you have to train yourself how to appraise things, to look at things and appraise them, discern them spiritually. You know, it says in Hebrews 5.14 that the solid food of the word is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. 
you have to train your senses to discern between good and evil. What the world calls good is not necessarily what God calls good, and I'm being very generous in, in saying that, right? What is what what is good? What is the what are the riches of God? Well, you know, Paul said we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The cross, the message of the cross, the word of the cross, is the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I always said, you know, the, the fruit of worldly wisdom, is, I call, the law of unexpected consequences. Mm. <laughs> well, because when you apply the world's wisdom, you're not going to get what you think you're going to get, and you're not going to get what you desire to get, I promise you. And I, I made a couple of notes here. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, thousands of children in 46 countries were born with horrific deformities. Thalidomide was found to act as an effective tranquilizer and painkiller and was proclaimed as a wonder drug for insomnia, coughs, colds, and headaches. It was also found to be an effective anti-emetic, which had an inhibitory effect on morning sickness. So thousands of pregnant women took the drug to relieve their symptoms. And thousands and thousands of children were born deformed. That's the application of, of worldly wisdom. It doesn't turn out the way you think it's going to turn out. And, and one of the ones I like to talk about is Dr. Benjamin Spock. You ever hear Dr. Benjamin Spock? You don't hear about him as much today by any means. For one thing, he repented. He said that, he said that what he taught was wrong. And yet, he had such an influence on families, it's incredible. I mean, people around the world were teaching, training their children, training them up in the way they should go, according to Dr. Spring. The word according to Dr. According to Dr. Spring. And he's a child psychologist, and he later said, we have reared a generation of brats. Mm -hmm. That was the result of his teaching. Parents aren't firm enough with their children for fear of losing their love and incurring their resentment. This is a cruel deprivation that we professionals have imposed on mothers and fathers. Of course, we did it with the best of intentions. We didn't realize that it was too, until it was too late how our know-it-all attitude was undermining the self-assurance of parents. That's the wisdom of the world. Yes. And that was an unexpected result. Yes, it was consequence. Wisdom has a purpose. I promise you that God's wisdom has a purpose. In Exodus 28.3, God spoke and said, you shall speak to all the skillful persons I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as a priest to me. God gave them wisdom to, to equip Aaron to serve God. And then in Deuteronomy 34, 9, it says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, and the sons of Israel listened to him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Because your own understanding is what you have gathered from the wisdom of the world, all right? And he doesn't give you that to, to gain wealth, all right? The Lord gives us his wisdom that we might be able to imitate him, that we may be able to act like him, okay? That's the purpose of God giving us this wisdom, so that we will know how to act. He has given us knowledge. He has given us understanding. But the purpose of that is so that we use it all wisely. You know, I said before, like through the car, you can know how to drive a car. You can understand the workings of it and the laws. But if you get in the car and speed all over the place and break all the traffic laws, where's the wisdom? No wisdom. And, and what's the result going to be? Chaos. Chaos. I'm going to tell you what the mind of Christ is. The mind of Christ says, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold? And to get oh, understanding is to be chosen above silver. Proverbs 16, 16. I mean, these are the things that God is telling us. 
you, you, you want silver and gold, you want riches? No, God says, want, want knowledge, want understanding, and then use it wisely. Okay? That wisdom is the, is the instruction on how to use what you've been given properly. I'm going to move on to verse 17 and 18. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You know, we, we serve the Prince of Peace. By the way, he's never won a Nobel Peace Prize. Wasn't that true? Yeah. The world doesn't recognize the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And the church has all too much been infected by the thinking of the world. Because, and this is why God says, don't learn the ways of the world. It's a lie. Jesus Christ, he is, he is peace. That's why I said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be son, called sons of God. He is the prince of peace. You got that? Uh -huh. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That is not, by the way, what Bill Clinton said. When he misquoted the, that verse, when he brought peace, when he brought peace, he, he brought peace between Israel and the Jordanians. And he said, for they shall inherit the earth. Because he was not about to stand there and talk to a Jew and a Muslim and say that they shall be called sons, sons of God. God. He couldn't. So he literally perverted the scripture. You need to be careful that you handle well and handle rightly, accurately, the word of God. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. That's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 14, verse 33. God has got a peace. He wants you to have a peace. You know, is this not a time of trial? Oh, yes. I mean, look at the situation that we, the, the world has been going through so all this year, maybe even a little before, but we didn't know about it, okay? It's been an absolute mess, absolute disorder, absolute chaos. And I'll tell you what, I don't know where you are, but I promise you here in the United States of America, it is still disorder, confusion, and no, no peace. No peace. All you have to do is look in the news and see what's going on around the world. Look what's going on around in this country. There's such a lack of peace. You know why? Because we have rejected the Prince of Peace. That's what you get when you reject the wisdom of God. We're, and and I, I, I don't want to sound judgmental, of course. You know what? It says in 1 Corinthians 5, yes, we're not to judge the outsiders. No. But are we not to judge those who are part of the church? Yes. Because these are the people that are supposed to be bringing that message of peace, bringing that, that message of love and peace. And we're not. We're, right now, here in America, what the church is involved in on both sides is the, the political game, the political situation. And I don't know where the wisdom is. Because people are saying on one side that you no, know, our guy is elected, there's going to be peace, things are going to be better. And on the other side, they're saying, well, if our guy is re-elected, there's going to be peace and everything's going to get better. Have you checked your history lately? How much peace has there been? How much? How, how well have we done at that? Because we have rejected the one thing that does bring peace, and that is the word of God. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. We need to be seeking God. We need to be walking in the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God does not look like the wisdom of the world. So don't be surprised that the world rejects you. It may be a little more surprising and a little more painful to see that the church rejects you for holding fast to the word of God. But you know what? Your job is not to please men. Your job is not to please the outsiders. Your job is not to be pleasing to anybody but God Almighty. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman. Hallelujah. 
The answer is in the Word of God. The answer has always been in the Word of God. For everything. For everything. God has given us everything. Peter said God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything that you need to know is in the Word of God. Amen. You know, I did, for years, I did business seminars. Now, I, before I got saved, I was, a, I was a consultant in New York City. I was a business consultant in New York City. I worked for what was at the time, I think, the biggest corporation in the world. And I, all my clients were major corporations. And then I wound up, after I did, when I got saved, I did seminars for business people on how to, how to run a business according to the scriptures. And yes, you can. Yes, you know, I've had the opportunity to put that into practice. And it's an amazing thing. It's a gl glorious thing. It's a wonderful thing. And you know what? There are some things, it doesn't matter whether you're saved or unsaved. There are principles, kind of something. That work for you. Yeah, you know, say, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Gravity works whether you're saved or not. I mean, there are a lot of principles of God that they're going to affect you the way God says, whether you're saved or not, whether you accept it. They just work that way. You want to run a business well? Do it according to the Word of God. Want to, to be successful? Want to run a family the way you should? Do it according to the Word of God. Whatever you do, do it according to the Word of God, and you will find God's blessings in your life. That is wisdom. And it's not wisdom that is earthly, natural, and demonic. It is wisdom from above. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you have sent us and given us wisdom from above, that you have spoken to us. You haven't hidden this, Lord God, but that you've made it clear. You've revealed it through your Son, Jesus Christ, and your Word. Your Word made flesh and dwelt among us. Lord, help us to make a commitment in our lives to live according to the Word for our own good. And Lord, that we might be a blessing to all the people around us. Because that's the promise of God. God said that if you hear my voice and you obey my voice, he said, I will bless you. I will bless you in the city. I will bless you in the country. I will bless you coming in. I will bless you going out. I will bless all of the work of your hands. I'll bless you. I'll bless your wife, your children, your family, your kitty cats, your puppy dog. That's a paraphrase. But you want to know something? It's true. That's wisdom. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. So we praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Well, time flies when you're having fun. Until next week, when we will continue on, may the Lord our God bless you, keep you, and use you for the glory of his name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.